going to be talking about doses and type of HRT and hormones in general, just trying to keep it really basic. Sorry it's an earlier time, but as many of you know, I'm in the middle of a tour, so I'm going down to Winchester tonight. Very exciting, I'm really enjoying doing the tour and meeting so many women. It's very sad hearing stories, of course, of women who aren't able to get any dose or any type of hormones, and there's a lot we need to do to change that. So, as you know, the first line treatment for perimenopause and menopause is actually replacing the missing hormones because what happens in menopause and perimenopause is that our hormone levels decline. So it makes sense to replace what's missing. Some people always ask, well, are you meddling with nature? Nature actually probably didn't intend us to live for so long without our hormones. There's lots we do that is meddling with nature in medicine, for example, giving painkillers to people in childbirth, helping sight loss, treating raised blood pressure, which is often a disease of ageing. And it's a choice whether people take HRT or not. Many of us choose to take HRT, not just to improve symptoms, but actually to improve future health. And we've known for decades, actually, nearly a 100 years, that our hormones, especially oestrogen, will help strengthen our bone and reduce our risk of osteoporosis. But we've also known for nearly as long as I've been alive, quite a long time, that our hormones reduce our risk of diabetes, heart disease and dementia and cognitive decline as well. They're very anti-inflammatory, so they reduce any accelerated ageing that occurs during menopause. So for those people that do want to take hormones, what are they, what do they do and what are the best types? So it's really just talking very simplistically about three hormones, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone. Now, when I talk about estradiol, it's really important to be specific about estradiol. It's one type of estrogen. There are different types of estrogen, but estradiol is the best type. It's very anti-inflammatory. It replaces what we miss. Now, these hormones are produced in our ovaries, so when our ovaries don't work as well, the levels decline. But they're also produced in our brain and other tissues. So they're actually called neurosteroids. They have really important functions in our brain and our body and our tissues and every single cell in our body. Now, of course, we can live without them because there are other hormones that are involved in our metabolic processes. But we know that a female body functions better when it's got the right amount of hormones for them. We're all individual. So when our hormones decline, they don't decline in a textbook way. Some people, their estradiol declines quicker than the other two hormones. Sometimes it's the testosterone that declines and sometimes it's the progesterone that declines. So generally, certainly the way I prescribe H HRT and, and the doctors and clinicians in my clinic usually do is to prescribe the three hormones separately so you can give back what's missing in a physiological way. So the important thing is having the right dose at the right time for the right person. And sometimes we give hormones to women with PMS, premenstrual syndrome, and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, because that's a hormonal decline. I spoke to one patient yesterday and she's really struggling just with a few days before her periods. And that's the time where she's going to take some hormones just in those few days. The rest of the time she feels fine, so she doesn't need hormones in those days. <clears throat> and that simple measure is likely to really help her. Now we're very lucky that the hormones we usually prescribe, like I say, are the complete replica of the hormones that we produce in our body. So chemically they're the same structure but they're usually divide, derived from soy and yam plants. So, you know, they're as good as we can get, actually. And what we normally do with the estradiol part is give it through the skin as a patch gel or there is the spray. And the reason that we do that is that it's the right size to penetrate through the skin, but it goes straight into the bloodstream. Anything we take through our mouths, whether it's food or a tablet or medication, gets metabolised through our system, especially our liver. So anything that we take orally will get metabolised into other, it will get broken down into other substances. Whereas if we have the estradiol through the skin, it stays as estradiol and goes straight through into the bloodstream. So the estradiol, I usually prescribe it as a patch or gel. I don't usually prescribe the spray because I find in my clinical experience it doesn't get absorbed very well. It's very unreliable. We've got in the UK two different manufacturers that do two different types of gel. One comes as a pump and one comes as a little sachet. And then we've also got 
Um, different manufacturers make patches, but generally in my clinical practice, I only use two because I find the others just really don't stick on very well. And the two I use are, are nice and so you change them twice a week. So they've essentially got enough hormone to be released slowly through the skin, usually for four days. So you change them, like I change mine on a Monday and a Thursday. So half the week it will be three days, the other half it will be four days. I would not remember if it was three and a half days. So it's just done in that way. There are seven day patches, but I just find that they just don't stick on for the whole seven days. But that's just in my clinical practice. Then we've got progesterone. Now there are lots of synthetic progestogens available that are all chemically altered. They're the ones that are in the contraceptive pill and even the progesterone only pill contains a synthetic progestogen. So I usually prescribe the natural progesterone, same chemical structure as progesterone itself. And there are two ways of having it, either orally or it can be given as a pessary. So that means given either vaginally or rectally. Now, most people are fine orally, but if we give it orally, then what happens is it gets metabolised through the liver, as I've said. And so what it means is it can be broken down into other types of progesterone. If we use it vaginally or even rectally, when it gets inserted in that way, it, goes, it gets absorbed through the mucous membranes into the bloodstream and it keeps as the pure progesterone, it doesn't get broken down. And some studies have shown doing it in that way, there's actually a higher amount that gets delivered to the womb as well. So some people prefer orally, some people as a pessary, and that's something to work out with your individual clinician. Um, and then <clears throat> some people obviously use a marina coil or a, um, a progesterone containing contraception that is a little coil. It's not really a coil, but it's a little device that goes in the womb. Now that's good for the lining of the womb. A little bit gets absorbed into the body, but it's a synthetic hormone. It's been chemically altered. It doesn't have the same active biological effects as the natural progesterone. And so it's, although it's good for the womb, it won't help the rest of the body. So some people take a progesterone as well as having a marina coil. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the third hormone, testosterone. There's two ways of giving it, either as a gel or a cream. Now in the UK, neither is licensed for women. We can use the, the gel off license for women or the cream is only available privately at the moment because it hasn't gone through to be licensed for anybody. So um, the, the gel is licensed for men and that's why we can use it off license. There are different formulations of the gel, um, but I tend to recommend the sachet. There is a pump that can be given, but often people give too high a doses. And it's like some people I've seen just say, have been told given, give one pump once a week or, uh, or twice a week, but then you get like a high dose and then the rest of the days you're getting nothing, which doesn't really make sense to me. So I tend to recommend the sachet and then make it last for several days and the number of days depends on the way it's absorbed. Um, and so then if you have the three hormones separately, you can adjust the dose with your healthcare professional that's right for you. There are also obviously vaginal hormones, which I won't cover now, but I've, put, I've, I've talked about it in another Instagram live, and they are not the same as systemic hormones. So they are a low dose vaginal preparation that gets inserted into the vagina and they can be used with or without hormones. So I'm really just talking about systemic hormones that get into the bloodstream and go all around the body. Now, generally, if you're starting HRT when you're perimenopausal, that means you're still having periods, then we usually um, give the progesterone for two out of four weeks, which basically means that you'll still have your periods. Um, it can take a few months sometimes to have your periods in a, in a sort of it's a, a natural pattern. Sometimes you can get some irregular bleeding initially and then it usually settles down. And then usually after about six to 12 months, we recommend to change. So you take the progesterone every evening and that usually means your periods stop. So unless you want your periods, that's the best way of doing it. I have met a few women over the last few weeks on this tour who've told me that they've been on the cyclical HRT for, for many, many years, still having periods, really desperate for their periods to stop, but no one's advised them to convert the way they're taking the progesterone to one at night. Um, so you don't have to be a certain age you don't have to have had the cyclical HRT for a certain length of time. The reason we don't start the continuous, i.e. every night progesterone from the start if women are perimenopausal, 
It's just because they can have really chaotic bleeding and it's really frustrating. So if someone is menopausal or postmenopausal, so they haven't had a period for at least a year, then usually we start the progesterone one at night um, because then it keeps the lining of the womb thin and people don't have periods. Anyone can have any spotting or bleeding for the first three to six months of having HRT just as your body gets used to it. We usually say take the progesterone at night time because it can cause a bit of natural sedation. That's just the way progesterone works in the body and a lot of people like that as a side effect, but it makes sense obviously taking it in the evening. Um, when we give it, uh, vagina is a pessary, it's often given in the evening, <clears throat> but sometimes people have it two or three or even four times a day, depending on their clinical scenario. And obviously then it can be spaced out throughout the day. It doesn't usually cause as much sedation when it's given vaginally because it doesn't activate something called GABA in the brain and GABA helps with sleep. So um, some people actually have some orally and vaginally and that again, it depends on the clinical context. The oestrogen gel, a lot of people ask if it has to be given in the morning or the evening, it doesn't matter what's part of your routine. But as general rule of thumb, um, and obviously everyone's different, but if you're using more than two pumps, if you're using, for example, four pumps, you might find it easier to use two pumps in the morning and two in the evening and just space it out. Um, and that often works quite well. Often, obviously changing the patch, you can do any time of the day that you like. The testosterone again, some people use it in the morning, some people use it in the evening. Just make it part of your routine so you don't forget. If you do forget using a dose, don't worry about it, just carry on as normal the next day or the day that you remember. But it is worth making a mental note if you do forget or skip a few days because you're more likely going to have some bleeding. So if you do, don't be too worried about the bleeding, it's probably related to missing a few doses. So just, just to reassure you really. Now, there's been a huge amount of confusion about dosing of hormones. And what I want to do is keep it really simple and obviously look at the evidence as well. So there's a, um, when we use the skin to get a, a, a hormone or a drug through the skin, everybody's skin is different. We don't actually have many preparations of anything we can use through the skin much in medicine. So obviously you know about nicotine patches, so nicotine will go through the skin. There's something called fentanyl, a painkiller that can go through the skin, but there's not much else because of the size of the particle of the drug often just doesn't get through the skin. When we put anything on our skin that isn't meant to go in our bloodstream, it stays on the surface. So for example, if I use moisturizer, if I use a sun cream, I don't want it going in my bloodstream. So it has to be made in a way. And um, But we have to remember that the skin is a barrier. So these other preparations are made in a way so that the skin keeps that barrier. Now, there are different things that control how permeable the skin is. So we know, for example, temperature of the skin, the blood vessels flowing through the skin, what else is going on subcutaneously, so if there's any fat there, so, so the depth of the skin, and also like how um, moisturised the skin is or not. Um, so there's lots of things that can determine the, the, text, the, the way that uh, um, the hormones are absorbed through the skin. There has been a study looking at ethnicity as well and showing that people who are from black and Asian ethnicity groups actually um, don't absorb as well through the skin. It makes common sense that if I was rubbing something, say, on my arm where I've got blood vessels right on the surface, it's going to absorb very differently to if I put something on my bottom which doesn't have blood vessels on the, uh, blood, uh, vessels on the surface and obviously has more fat over the top. And so we know this from studies, studies of looking at any drug delivery system through the skin, we know there's a big difference in absorption depending on the location of the body and between individuals. It's no different when you think about estradiol. So estradiol is either in the glue of the patches or it's in the gel of the gel. And so it depends on how that penetrates through the skin. When they look at the licensing of the hormones, then they actually just want to make sure, does it go through, is it absorbed, does the patch stick on or not? And when I've looked at all the studies that they use to, to have a license maximum, the number of women in the studies has been very low. In fact, it's been incredibly low. It's actually been less than 40 women in most studies. And those studies have been done between four and seven days. 
So not very long to really look at any sustained absorption at all. Um, and even those studies show there was a massive variation with some women not absorbing much at all, even with a higher licensed dose. Now there's lots of doses of medication we do give off license because people need them. We're all individual. Medicine is an art as well as a science and the art is individualizing a dose and a type of medication for each person. So if people are not absorbing very well through the skin, you can give them a thousand times the dose and they're still not going to absorb very well through the skin. So if someone isn't absorbing, say, 100 microgram patch very well, there are options. One of the things would be to change the manufacturer of the patch. So go from one manufacturer to another where the glue is different. So therefore the absorption through the skin might be different. Or we might change someone from a patch to the gel and give the same equivalent dose, um, but they might absorb through the skin, through the gel better. So it's not always about changing the dose. But if someone has um, symptoms and we do their blood test and their estradiol level is low, then it suggests that they're not absorbing very well. So we might change the location of where they're sticking the patch, for example, or we might increase the dose. Because what you want to do is have the right dose going into your bloodstream. And if the dose going in is low, regardless of the actual dose of the patch that's put on, then it makes sense to increase so you get more going through. And many of you know I use a higher than licensed dose because my patches don't stick on very well. They crinkle. So when they're crinkling, not every, not all the surface area is sticking to my skin. So therefore, some of it won't be absorbed. So having two or three patches not sticking on well is going to be the same as one patch sticking on really well for somebody else. Um, and we know this for studies. We know there's a ten, tenfold variation between absorption in women. And actually one study showed a 22-fold variation depending on the location of where the patches were applied. So it's very basic pharmacology that seems to have got very confused. When we look at risks of estradiol, there aren't any documented risks because estradiol is our natural hormone. We know that if we only give estradiol on its own, there will, for some women, be a thickening of the lining of the womb called hyperplasia. And indeed, that's what happens with every woman when she's having a natural cycle, because there's more estradiol than progesterone initially, and there's a, a, the, the lining of the womb thickens, cause, causing hyperplasia. Then when the, the level of progesterone goes up, then the, the lining is shred and they have a period. So we always give a progesterone when we give estradiol to stop any bleeding or reduce the risk of any hyperplasia. But some women will have hyperplasia thickening regardless of the dose. There hasn't been a study to show that the higher the dose or even the higher level of estradiol in the body is associated with more hyperplasia. We've just presented some data actually looking at our scan data and show that actually women on a lower dose of estradiol were more likely to have hyperplasia than those um, on a higher dose. So, you know, everyone's different and everyone's womb's different and the way they respond is different. But there isn't any evidence that estradiol actually causes cancer of the lining of the womb. We know from studies that women who take combination HRT, so estradiol and progesterone, or estrogen and progesterone in some of the older studies, actually have a lower incidence of cancer of the lining of the womb compared to anyone else. There's more women that have bleeding, but that doesn't mean more women have cancer, which is very, very reassuring. All the studies looking at cancer have been done on synthetic hormones, so the hormones that have been chemically altered, including the conjugated equine oestrogens, which is the oestrogens from pregnant horses' urine. So when we're looking at the data, it's really important to look at it. Is it data on um, the synthetic hormones or the pregnant horses' urines hormones or our natural hormones? And there is a, there is a difference. Some people say that you have to automatically increase the dose of the progesterone if the dose of estradiol is increased. Now, often we increase the dose of estradiol just to get the same amount through the skin. So it doesn't make sense to just automatically increase dose of progesterone because not everyone needs a higher dose of progesterone and that actually increasing the dose is an off license dose of progesterone. So we've always got to balance the right hormones for the right person. 
Sometimes we increase the dose of progesterone, even if we don't increase the dose of estradiol, because a woman's bleeding, for example, and it might be that she needs more progesterone than estradiol, because we're all different. So it is looking at the balance of these hormones as well. We also know there's lots and lots of reasons why people have bleeding, so it's so easy to blame HRT, but other people have, um, uh, they have conditions such as fibroids or they have polyps and that it can they can bleed irrespective of, of hormones and certainly irrespective of um, doses as well so we need to just not be sort of too quick to blame hormones i know a lot of patients and i've spoken to loads of women recently who have been told by their gynecologist just stop your hormones and then your bleeding will settle well, that's not very useful for them when their hormones are actually improving their symptoms and also improving their future health as well. Now, anyone who starts taking HRT, it can take three to six months for the HRT to have its effect. So you can't expect to start using something necessarily and feel amazing the next day. It takes a while for our body to actually adjust to the hormones and for our receptors to start working and for these chemical reactions, if you like, to occur in the cells as well as genetic changes to occur to improve our symptoms and our future health. So usually we try and um, enable patients and women to be quite patient when they start HRT. You've got to try and be patient and allow the hormones to work rather than changing the dose too quickly. In our clinic, we do do estradiol levels and they are a guide. You know, when someone's perimenopausal, what happens naturally is the hormones really fluctuate. So sometimes we see people with high levels of estradiol, um, but they're perimenopausal. So it's not just the hormone that they're um, absorbing through the skin as well. So if we see someone and they've got a, a raised estradiol level, then often we repeat it and talk to the women, see how they are. Because any, any test in medicine is helpful, but the most important thing is speaking to women and seeing how they are. When women use testosterone, we usually do a baseline testosterone level, and then we also repeat the testosterone regularly, depending on the clinical scenario, but at least every year, to see how the testosterone is being absorbed into the bloodstream as well. So really important that we um, assess properly because some people don't feel better on testosterone and then we find that they're not absorbing it properly. So they might change from the cream to the gel or the gel to the cream or their dose might need changing or the location where they're applying. And so we know that the penetrance, the absorption of the gels, the creams, the patches is all different in all of us. So it makes sense that many of us need different doses. Um, and Often with time, doses might need to change. So if a woman starts her hormones when she's perimenopausal, when she becomes menopausal, it means that her own hormones will have declined. And what we're trying to do with hormones is just to replace what's missing in a physiological way. So if we start hormones when a woman's still producing hormones from her ovaries, then it does obviously make sense that she's going to need more with time. And we just review that and see. Some people need less with time and we're all different because sometimes in the perimenopause we give a higher dose to stop this big fluctuation that can trigger so many awful symptoms. So having a higher amount will often then stop that fluctuation and then with time we can reduce the dose. The other thing just to add before I finish is that when we look at the dosing of HRT and compare it with dosing in contraception, now there's two things to think about here. One is that all contraceptions are synthetic. They are chemically altered, so they don't have the natural biological processes that you get with the natural hormones in HRT. But the other thing is the doses are so much higher. So if you equivalent the even the low dose pill that contains ethanol estradiol, which is a synthetic estrogen, that dose equivalent is far higher than any dose of estradiol and HRT, even the 300 micrograms higher than licensed dose of estradiol. So we have to really look at the bigger picture. If everyone's so scared of HRT, why aren't they so scared of contraception? Because they're still being given to women. And we know that a lot of women, especially younger women, often need higher doses of HRT to optimize their symptoms and their future health. 
but people seem more scared of hormones that are natural in HRT than they are in the synthetic contraceptions, which haven't been tested as well. They're all synthetic and we know that they do have established risks. The risks are small, but there's still risks that aren't there with natural hormones. And that's just something to think about, which I think a lot of people, including doctors, haven't thought about for far too long. And we need to be having these conversations to try and enable women to be as healthy as possible and to have the right choices regarding their treatment with hormones. So if you do want to take hormones, make sure you're taking the right dose and type and also that you're reviewed regularly so we can really enable each of us to have the full effect that's going to be good for our symptom control but are also for our future health as well. Finally, no one needs to stop taking hormones at a certain time or after a certain duration. Once our hormone levels are low, they will low, be low forever unless we replace those missing hormones. So most women choose to take hormones forever to replace their missing hormones to optimise their future health. So you don't need to stop at a certain time or a certain age or a certain duration of taking hormones. Like I say, you should be reviewed regularly at least a year to make sure that you are on the right dose and type, make sure you're absorbing properly, make sure you don't have any side effects and see if anything else needs altering. But other than that, taking hormones is actually quite straightforward. It's one of the safest medicines I've ever prescribed as a doctor. And actually, a lot of it is just common sense as well. So I hope that's unpicked quite a lot for you and explained things in hopefully quite a simple way. A lot of information to take on board and hopefully you can listen to it again, take some notes, ask me any questions. Um, next week I'll probably do just a live Q&A again, but I just thought this would be useful for you. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday and enjoy the week ahead as well. Take care.